Chapter Twenty of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter Twenty: The Love Affairs of a Regent. When Louis the Fourteenth laid down one September day in the year seventeen fifteen the crown which he had worn with such splendor for more than seventy years, his sceptre fell into the hands of his nephew Philippe, Duc d'Orleans, who for eight years ruled France as regent and as guardian of the child king, the fifteenth Louis. Seldom in the world's history has a reign so splendid as that of the Sun King closed in such darkness and tragedy. The disastrous war of the Spanish succession had drained France of her strength and her gold. She lay crushed under a mountain of debt, ten thousand million francs. She was reduced to the lowest depths of wretchedness, ruin, and disorder, and it was at this crisis in her life as a nation that fate placed a child of four on her throne and gave the reins of power into the hands of the most dissolute man in Europe. Not that Philippe of Orléans lacked many of the qualities that go to the making of a ruler and a man he had proved himself in italy and in spain one of the bravest of his country's soldiers and an able far-seeing leader of armies and he had as his regency proved no mean gifts of statesmanship but his kingly qualities were marred by the taint of birth and early environment such good qualities as he had no doubt drew from his mother the capable austere high-minded elizabeth of bavaria who to her last day was the one good influence in his life. To his father, Louis the Fourteenth's younger brother, who was said to have been son of Cardinal Mazarin, Anne of Austria's lover, and who was the most debased man of his time in all France, he just as surely owed the bias of sensuality to which he chiefly owes his place in memory. And not only was he thus handicapped by his birth, he had for tutor that arch-scoundrel Dubois, the groveling insect who rarely opened his mouth without uttering a blasphemy or indecency, and who initiated his charge, while still a boy, into every base form of so-called pleasure. Such was the man who, amid the ruins of his country, inaugurated in France an era of licentiousness such as she had never known, an incomprehensible mass of contradictions, a kingly presence with the soul of a Caliban, statesman and sinner, high-minded and low-living, spending his days as a sovereign, a role which he played to perfection, and his nights as a sot and a sensualist. It was doubtless Dubois who was mostly responsible for the baseness in the regent's character. Dubois, who had taught him a contempt for religion and morality, the cynical view of life which makes the pleasure of the moment the only thing worth pursuing, at whatever cost, and who had impressed indelibly on his mind that no woman is virtuous and that men are knaves and there was never any lack of men to continue dubois teaching he gathered round him the most dissolute gallants in france in whose company he gave the rein to his most vicious appetites his roues he dubbed them a title which aptly described them although they affected to give it a very different interpretation they were the regent's roues they said no doubt with the tongue in cheek because they were so devoted to him that they were ready in his defence to be broken on the wheel la roue each of these boon comrades was a past master in the art of dissipation and each was also among the most brilliant men of his day the chevalier de simiane was famous alike for his drinking powers and his gift of graceful verse de fargy was a polished wit and the handsomest man in france with an unrivalled reputation for gallantry the comte de nocé was the regent's most intimate friend from boyhood brother-in-law he called him since they had not only tastes but even mistresses in common then there were the marquis de la fare captain of the guards and bon enfant the marquis de broglio the biggest debauche in france the marquis de cagnac the duc de branca and many others all famous or infamous for some pet vice and all the best of boon companions for the pleasure-loving regent strange tales are told of the orgies of this select band which the regent gathered around him orgies which shocked even the france of the eighteenth century when she was the acknowledged leader in license at six o'clock every evening philippe's kingship ended for the day he had had enough 
more than enough of state and ceremonial of interviewing ambassadors and of the flatteries of princes and the obsequious homage of courtiers pleasure called him away from the boredom of the empire and at the stroke of six we find him retiring to the company of his mistresses and his roues to feast and drink and gamble until dawn broke on the revelry his laugh the loudest his wit the most dazzling his stories the most piquant keeping the table in a roar with his infectious gaiety he was regent no longer he was simply a bon camarade as ready to exchange familiarities with a lady of the ballet as to lead the laughter at a joke at his own expense at nine o'clock when the fun had waxed furious and wine had set the slowest tongue wagging and every eye a sparkle other guests streamed in to join the orgy the most beautiful ladies of the court from the duchesse de gesor and madame de mouchy to the regent's own daughter the duchesse de barry who young as she was had little to learn of the arts of dissipation and in the wake of these high-born women would follow laughing bright-eyed troops of dancing and chorus girls from the theatres with an escort of the cleverest actors of paris to join the regent's merry throng the champagne now flowed in rivers the servants were sent away the doors were locked and the fun grew riotous ceremony had no place there rank and social distinctions were forgotten countesses flirted with comedians princes made love to ballet girls and duchesses alike the leader of the moment was the man or woman who could sing the most daring song tell the most piquant story or play the most audacious practical joke even on the regent himself sometimes we are told the lights would be extinguished and the orgy continued under the cover of darkness until the regent suddenly opened a cupboard in which lights were concealed to an outburst of shrieks of laughter at the scenes revealed thus the mad night hours passed until dawn came to bring the revels to a close or until the regent would sally forth with a few chosen comrades on a midnight ramble to other haunts of pleasure in the capital the lower the better such was the way in which philippe of orleans regent of france spent his nights a few hours after the carouse had ended he would resume his sceptre as austere and dignified a ruler as you would find in europe it must not be imagined that philippe was the only royal personage who thus set a scandalous example to france there was in fact scarcely a prince or princess of the blood royal whose love affairs were not conducted flagrantly in the eyes of the world from the dowager duchesse de bourbon who lavished her favours on the scotch financier john law of loriston to the princesse de conte who mingled her piety with a marked partiality for her nephew le calière as for the regent's own daughters from the duchesse de berry to louise queen of spain each has left behind her a record almost as scandalous as that of her father it was in fact an era of corruption in high places when in the reaction that followed the dismal and decorous last years of louis the fourteenth's reign pleasure rose phoenix-like from the ashes of ruin and flaunted herself unashamed in every guise with which vice could deck her it must be said for the regent corrupt as he was that he never abused his position and his power in the pursuit of beauty his mistresses flocked to him from every rank of life from the stage to the highest court circles but remained no longer than inclination dictated and the fascination is not far to seek for philippe d'orleans was of the men who find easy conquests in the field of love he was one of the handsomest men in all france and to his good looks and his reputation for bravery he added a manner of rare grace and courtliness a supple tongue and that strange magnetic power which few women could resist no king ever boasted a greater or more varied list of favourites in which actresses and duchesses vied with each other for his smiles in a rivalry which seems to have been singularly free from petty jealousy among the beauties of the court we find the duchesse de fedari the duchesse de gesor the comtesse de sabrin at one extreme and actresses like emilie desmarres and la souris at the other pretty butterflies of the footlights who appealed to the regent no more than madame d'averne the gifted pet of france's wits and literary men the most charming blue stocking of her day and all without exceptions duchesses countesses and actresses were as ready to give their love to philippe the man as to the duc d'orleans regent of france even in his relations with these ministers of pleasure the regent's better qualities often exhibit themselves agreeably to the pretty actress emilie whose heart was so completely his, he always acted with a characteristic generosity and forbearance, and her conduct is by no means less pleasing than his. 
once we are told when he expressed a wish to give her a pair of diamond earrings at a cost of fifteen thousand francs she demurred at accepting so valuable a present if you must be so generous she pleaded please don't give me the earrings which are much too grand for such as me give me instead ten thousand francs so that i might buy a small house to which i can retire when you no longer love me as you do now Emilie had scarcely returned home, however, when a court official appeared with a package containing not ten thousand, but twenty-five thousand francs, which her lover insisted on her keeping, and when she returned fifteen thousand francs, he promptly sent them back again, declaring that he would be very angry if she refused again to accept them. His love, indeed, for Emilie seems to have been as pure and deep as any of which he was capable. It was no fleeting passion, but an affection based on a sincere respect for her character and mental gifts. So highly, indeed, did he think of her judgment that she became his most trusted counsellor. She sat by his side when he received ambassadors, he consulted her on different problems of state, and it was her advice that he often followed in preference to the wisdom of all his ministers, for, as he said to Dubois, Emilie has an excellent brain, she always gives me the best counsel. When at last he had to part from the modest and accomplished actress, it was under circumstances which speak well for his generosity. A former lover, the Marquis de Fimarcon, on his returning from fighting in Spain, sought Emilie out, and, blazing with jealousy, insisted that she should leave the regent and return to his protection. He vowed that if she refused he would murder her, and when in her alarm she sought refuge in a convent at Charenton, he threatened to burn the nuns alive in their cells unless they restored her to him. Thus it was that rather than allow Emilie to run any risks from her revengeful and brutal lover, the regent relinquished his claim to her, and only when Fimarcon's continued brutality at last made intervention necessary did he order the bully to be arrested and consigned to the prison of Fort Levesque. It is, however, in the story of Mademoiselle Essay, the Circassian slave, that we find the best illustration of the chivalry which underlay the regent's passion for women, and which he never forgot in his wildest excesses. This story, one of the most touching in French history, opens in the year 1698, when a band of Turkish soldiers returned to Constantinople from a raid in the Caucasus, bringing with them, among many other captives, a beautiful child of four years, said to be the daughter of a king so lovely was the little circassian fairy that when the comte de feriol france's ambassador to turkey set eyes on her he decided to purchase her and she became his property in exchange for fifteen hundred livres that she might have every advantage of training to fit her for his seraglio in later years the child was sent to paris to the home of the ambassador's brother president de feriol where she grew to a beautiful girlhood as a member of the family as fair a flower as ever was transplanted to french soil Thus she passed the next thirteen years of her life, charming all by her sweetness of disposition, as she won the homage of all by her remarkable beauty and grace. Such was Ayesha, or Essay, the Circassian maid, when at last her owner returned to Paris to fall under the spell of her radiant beauty and to claim her as his chattel, bought with good gold and trained at his cost to adorn his harem. In vain did Essay weep and plead to be spared a fate from which every fibre of her being shrank in horror. Her master was inexorable. When I bought you, he said, it was my intention to make you my daughter or my mistress. I now intend that you shall become both the one and the other. Friendless and helpless, she was obliged to yield, and for six years she had to submit to the endearments of her protector, a man more than old enough to be her father, until his death brought her release. At twenty-four, more lovely than ever, combining the beauty of the Circassian with the graces of France, A.C. had now every right to look forward at least to such happiness as was possible to a stranger in a strange land. But no sooner was one danger to her peace removed than another sprang up to take its place. The rumor of her beauty and her sweetness had come to the ears of the regent, and strong forces were at work to bring her to his arms. Madame de Tincin was the leader in this base conspiracy, with the power of the Romish church at her back, for with the fair Circassian high in the regent's favor, and a pliant tool in their hands, the Jesuits' influence at court would be greatly strengthened. Dubois was won over to the unholy alliance, and the Du's maîtresse en titre was bribed not only to withdraw all opposition to her proposed rival, but to arrange a meeting between the regent and the victim. 
success seemed to be assured mademoiselle essai was to exchange slavery to her late owner for an equally odious place in the harem of the ruler of france her tears and entreaties were all in vain when she begged on her knees to be allowed to retire to a convent madame de Ferriol turned her back on her her only hope of rescue now lay in the regent himself and to him she pleaded her cause with such pathetic eloquence that he not only allowed her to depart in peace but with words of sympathy and promises of his protection in the pure and noble sense of the word thus by the chivalry of the most dissolute man of his age the circassian slave-girl was rescued from a life which to her would have been worse than death to spend her remaining years happy in the love of an honest man the chevalier Dedi until death claimed her while she still possessed the beauty which had been at once her glory and her inevitable shame the close of the regent's misspent life came with tragic suddenness worn out with excesses while still young in years his doctors had warned him that death might come to him any day but with the light-heartedness that was his to the last he laughed at their gloomy forebodings and refused to take the least precautions to safeguard his health two days before the end came he declined point-blank to be bled in order to avert a threatened attack of apoplexy let it come if it will he said with a laugh i do not fear death and if it comes quickly so much the better on the evening of the second of december seventeen twenty he was chatting gaily to the young duchesse de falary when he suddenly turned to her and asked do you think there is any hell or paradise of course i do answered the duchesse then are you not afraid to lead the life you do? Well, replied madame, I think God will have pity on me. Scarcely had the words left her lips when the regent's head fell heavily on her shoulder and he began to slip to the floor. A glance showed her that he was unconscious, and rushing out of the room, the terrified duchesse raced through the dark deserted corridors of the palace shrieking for help. When at last help arrived it came too late. The regent had gone to find for himself an answer to the questions his lips had framed a few minutes earlier. Is there any hell or paradise? End of chapter 20。Chapter 21 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Russo. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 21. A Delilah of the Court of France. It was a cruel fate that snatched Gabrielle d'Estres from the arms of Henry IV, King of France and Navarre, at the moment when her long devotion to her hero lover was on the eve of being crowned by the bridal veil, and for many a week there was no more stricken man in europe than the disconsolate king as he wailed in his black draped chamber the root of my love is dead and will never blossom again no doubt henry's grief was as sincere as it was deep for he had loved his golden-haired gabrielle of the blue eyes and dimpled baby cheeks as he had never loved woman before it was the passion of a lifetime the passion of a strong man in his prime that fate had thus nipped in the fullness of its bloom and its loss plunged him into an abyss of sorrow and despair such as few men have known but with a hero of ivory no emotion of grief or pleasure ever endured long he was a man of erratic widely contrasted moods now on the peak of happiness now in the gulf of dejection one mood succeeding another as inevitably and widely as the pendulum swings thus when he had spent three seemingly endless months of gloom and solitude reaction seized him and he flung aside his grief with his black raiment he was still in the prime of his strength with many years before him he would drink the cup of life even to its dregs he had long been weary of the matrimonial chains that fettered him to marguerite de valois he would strike them off and in another wife and other loves find a new lease of pleasure thus it was with no heavy heart that he turned his back on fontainebleau and his darkened room and fared to paris to find a new vista of pleasure opening to him at his palace doors and his ears full of the praises of a new divinity who had come during his absence to grace his court a girl of such beauty sprightliness and wit as his capital had not seen for many a year henriette d'entragues for this was the divinity's name 
was equipped by fate as few women were ever equipped for the conquest of a king her mother marie touche had been light a love to charles ninth her father was the seigneur d'entraigues member of one of the most blue-blooded families of france a soldier and statesman of fame and their daughter had inherited with her mother's beauty and grace the clever brain and diplomatic skill of her father a strange mixture of the bewitching and bewildering this daughter of a king's mistress seems to have been tall and dark voluptuous figure with ripe red lips and bold and dazzling black eyes she was in her full-blooded sensuous charms the very antipodes to the childish fairy-like gabrielle who had so long been enshrined in the king's heart and to this physical appeal irresistible to a man of such strong passion as henri she added gifts of mind which baby gabrielle could never claim she had a wit as brilliant as the tongue which was its vehicle her well-stored brain was more than a match for the most learned men at court and she would leave an archbishop discomfited in a theological argument to cross words with sully himself on some abstruse problem of statesmanship when sally had been brought to his knees she would rush away with mischief in her eyes to take the lead in some merry escapade or practical joke her silvery laughter echoing in some remote palace corridor a bewildering alluring bundle of inconsistencies beauty savant wit and madcap such was henriette d'entraigues when henry fresh from his woes came under the spell of her magnetism here indeed was an escape from his grief such as the king had never dared to hope for before he had been many hours in his palace henry was caught hopelessly in the toils of the new siren and was intoxicated by her smiles and witcheries never was conquest so speedy so dramatic before a week had flown he was at henrietta's feet as lovesick and swain as ever sighed for a lady pouring love into her ears and writing her passionate letters between the frequent meetings in which he would send her a good night my dearest heart with a million kisses in the days of his lusty youth the idol and hero of france had never known passion such as this which consumed him within sight of his fiftieth birthday and which was inspired by a woman of much less than half his years for at the time henri was forty-six and henriette barely twenty he quickly found however that this wooing was not to be all plain sailing when henriette's parents heard of it they affected to be horrified at the danger in which their beloved daughter was placed they summoned her home from the perils of court and the king's passion and when henry sent an envoy to bring them to reason they sent him back with a rebuff their daughter was to be no man's not even a king's plaything if henry's passion was sincere he must prove it by a definite promise of marriage and only on this condition would their opposition be removed even to such a stipulation henry such was his infatuation made no demur with his own hand he wrote an agreement pledging himself to make demoiselle henriette his lawful wife in case within a certain period she became the mother of a son and undertaking to dissolve his marriage with his wife marguerite of france for this purpose and this agreement signed with his own hand he sent to the seigneur d'entraigues and his wife accompanied by a douceur of a hundred thousand crowns but before it was dispatched the more formidable obstacle than even the lady's natural guardians remained to be faced none other than the duc de sully the man who had shared all paris in a hundred fights with henry and was at once his chief counsellor and his fidus achat when at last he summoned up courage to place the document in sully's hands he awaited the verdict as nervously as any schoolboy in the presence of a dreaded master sully read through the paper was silent for a few moments and then spoke sire he said am i to give you my candid opinion of this document without fear of anger or giving offence certainly answered the king well then this is what i think of it was sully's reply as he tore the document in two pieces and flung them on the floor sully you are mad exclaimed henry flaring into anger at such an outrage you are right sire i am a weak fool and would gladly know myself still more a fool if i might be the only one in france it was in vain however that sully pointed out the follies and dangers of such a step as was proposed 
Andrew's mind was made up, and leaving his friend in high dudgeon, he went to his study and rewrote his promise of marriage. The way was at last clear to the gratification of his passion. Henriette was more than willing, her parents' scruples and greed were appeased, and as for Sully, well, he must be left to get over his tantrums even to please such an old and trusted friend he could not sacrifice such an opportunity for pleasure and a new lease of life as now presented itself halcyon months followed for henry months in which even gabrielle was forgotten in the intoxication of a new passion compared with which the memory of her gentle charms was but as water to rich red wine that henriette proved wilful capricious and extravagant that her vanity drained his exchequer of hundreds of thousands of crowns for costly jewellery and dresses was a mere bagatelle compared with his delight in her manifold allurements but sully had by no means said his last word the decree for annulling heron's marriage with marguerite de valois was pronounced and it was of the highest importance that she should have a worthy successor as queen of france a successor whom he found in marie de medicis the marriage contract was actually sealed before the king had any suspicion that his hand was being disposed of and it was only when sully one day entered his study with the startling words sire we have been marrying you that the awakening came for a few moments henry sat as a man stunned his head buried in his hands then with a deep sigh he spoke if god orders it so so let it be there seems to be no escape since you say that it is necessary for my kingdom and my subjects why marry i must it was a strange predicament in which henry now found himself still more infatuated than ever with henriette he was to be tied for life to a princess whom he had never even seen to add to the embarrassment of his position the condition of his marriage promise to henriette was already on the way to fulfilment and he was thus pledged to wed her as strongly as any state compact could bind him to stand at the altar with marie de medicis one thing was clear he must at any cost recover that fatal document and while he was giving orders for the suitable reception of his new queen and arranging for her triumphal progress to paris he was writing to henriette and her parents demanding the return of his promise of marriage agreement to her a pleading letter in which he prays her to return the promise you have by you and not to compel me to have recourse to other means in order to obtain it to her father a more imperious demand to which he expects instant obedience as some consolation to his mistress whose alternate tears rage and reproaches drove him to distraction he creates her marquise de verneuil and promises that if he should be unable to marry her he will at least give her a husband of royal rank the duc de nevers who was eager to make her his wife but pleadings and threats alike fail to secure the return of the fatal document and henry is reduced to despair until henriette gives birth to a dead child and his promise thus becomes of as little value as the paper it was written on the condition has failed and he is a free man to marry his tuscan princess while henriette thus foiled in her great ambition is in danger not only of losing her coveted crown but her place in the king's favour the days of her wilful autocracy are ended and though her heart is full of anger and disappointment she writes to him a pitiful letter imploring him still to love her and not to cast her from the heaven to which he has raised her down to the earth where he found her do not let your wedding festivities be the funeral of my hopes she writes do not banish me from your royal presence and your heart i speak in sighs of you my king my lover my all i who have been loved by the earth's greatest monarch and am willing to be his mistress and his servant to such humility was the proud arrogant beauty now reduced she was an abject suppliant where she had reigned a queen nor did her pleadings fall on deaf ears her royal lover's hand was given against his will to his new queen but his heart he vowed was all henriette's so much so that he soon installed her in sumptuous rooms in his palace adjoining those of the queen herself was ever a man placed in a more delicate position than this king of france between the rival claims of his wife and mistress who were occupying adjacent apartments and who moreover were both about to become mothers 
it speaks well of henry's tactfulness that for a time at least this menage a trois appears to have been quite amiably conducted when queen mary gave birth to a son it was to henriette that the infant's father first confided the good news seasoning it with a million kisses for herself and when henriette in turn became a mother for the second time the double royal event was celebrated by fete and rejoicings in which each lady took an equally proud and conspicuous part it was inevitable however that a woman so favoured by the king and of so imperious a nature should have enemies at court and it was not long before she became the object of a conspiracy of which the duchesse de villars and the queen were the arch leaders one day a bundle of letters was sent anonymously to henry letters full of tenderness and passion addressed by his beloved marquise henriette to the prince of joinville the king was furious at such evidence of his mistress's disloyalty and vowed he would never see her again but all his storming and reproaches left the marquise unmoved she declared with scorn in her voice that the letters were forgeries that she had never written to Jeanville in her life nor spoken a word to him that his majesty might not have heard she even pointed out the forger the duc de guise's secretary and was at last able to convince the king of her innocence the duchess de villars and joinville were banished from the court in disgrace the queen had a severe lecture from her husband and Ariette was not only restored to full favour but was consoled by a welcome present of six thousand pounds but the days of peace in the king's household were now gone for ever queen mary thus humiliated by her rival became her bitter enemy and also a thorn in the side of her unfaithful husband every day brought its fierce quarrels which only stopped on the verge of violence more than once in fact henry had to beat a retreat before his queen's clenched fist while she lost no opportunity of insulting and humiliating the marquise it is impossible altogether to withhold sympathy from a man thus distracted between two jealous women a shrewish wife who in her most amiable mood repelled his advances with coldness and cutting words and a mistress who vented on him all the resentment which the queen's insults and snubs roused in her even all sally's diplomacy was powerless to pour oil on such vexed waters as these the queen however had not long to wait for her revenge which came with the disclosure of a conspiracy at the head of which were henriette's father and her half-brother the comte d'auvergne and in which it was proved she herself had played no insignificant part punishment came swift and terrible her father and brother were sentenced to death herself to perpetual confinement in a monastery but even at this crisis in her life henriette's stout heart did not fail her for a moment the king may take my life if he pleases she said everybody will say that he killed his wife for i was queen before the tuscan woman came on the scene at all none knew better than she that she could afford thus to put on a bold front henri was still her slave to whom her little finger was more than his crown and she knew that in his hands both her liberty and her life were safe and thus it proved for before she had spent many weeks in the monastery of beaumont les tours its doors were flung open for her and the first news she heard was that her father was a free man while her brother's death sentence had been commuted to a few years in the bastille thus henriette returned to the turbulent life of the palace the daily routine of quarrels and peacemaking with the king and undisguised hostility from the queen through all of which henry's heart still remained hers how i long to have you in my arms again he writes when on a hunting excursion which had led him to the scene of their early romance as my letter brings back the memory of the past i know you will feel that nothing in the present is worth anything in comparison this at least was my feeling as i walked along the roads i so often traversed in the old days on my journey to your side when i sleep i dream of you when i wake my thoughts are all of you he sends her a million kisses and vows that all he asks of life is that she shall always love him entirely and him alone one would have thought that such a conquest of a king and such triumph over a queen would have gratified the ambition of the most exacting of women 
but the marquise de verneuil seems to have found small satisfaction in her victories when she was not provoking quarrels with henry which roused him to such a pitch of anger that at times he threatened to strike her she received his advances with a coldness or a sullen acquiescence calculated to chill the most ardent lover in other moods she would drive him to despair by declaring that she had long ceased to love him and that all she wanted from him was a dowry to carry in marriage to one or other of several suitors who were dying for her hand but madame's day of triumph was drawing much nearer to an end than she imagined the end in fact came with dramatic suddenness when henry first set eyes on the radiantly lovely charlotte de montmorency weary at heart of the tempers and exactions of henriette it needed but such a lure as this to draw him finally from her side and from the first flash of charlotte's beautiful eyes this most susceptible of kings was undone madame de verneuil's reign was ended the next quarrel was made the occasion for a complete rupture and the court saw her no more already she had lost the bloom of her beauty she had grown stout and coarse through her excessive fondness for the pleasures of the table and the rest of her days which were passed in friendless isolation she spent in indulging appetites which added to her mountain of flesh while robbing her of the last trace of good looks when the knife of Ravaillac brought Henri's life and his new romance to a tragic end, the Marquise was among those who were suspected of inspiring the assassin's blow, and although her guilt was never proved, the taint of suspicion clung to her to her last day. After fruitless angling for a husband, the Duc de Guise, the Prince de Jeanville, and many another who, with one consent, fled from her advances, she resigned herself to a life of obscurity and gluttony, until death came, one day, in the year 1633, to release her from a world of vanity and disillusionment. End of chapter 21《Chapter Twenty Two of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter Twenty Two The Sun King and the Widow. Search where you will in the record of kings and you will find nowhere a figure more splendid and more impressive than that of the fourteenth louis who for more than seventy years ruled over france and for more than fifty eclipsed in glory his fellow-sovereigns as the sun pales the stars nearly two centuries have gone since he closed his weary and disillusioned eyes on the world he had so long dominated but to-day he shines in history in the galaxy of monarchs with a lustre almost as great as when he was hailed throughout the world as the sun king and in his pride exclaimed i am the state placed like his successor on the greatest throne in europe a child of five fortune exhausted itself in lavishing gifts on him the world was at his feet almost before he had learned to walk he grew to manhood amid the adulation and flatteries of the greatest men and the fairest of women and that he might lack no great gift he was dowered with every physical perfection that should go to the making of a king there was no more goodly youth in france than louis when he first practised the arts of love-making in which he later became such an adept on mazarin's lovely niece marie mancini tall with a well-knit supple figure with dark beautiful eyes illuminating a singularly handsome face with a bearing of rare grace and distinction this son of anne of austria was a lover whom few women could resist such conquests came to him with fatal ease and for thirty years at least until satiety killed passion there was no lack of beautiful women to minister to his pleasure and to console him for the lack of charms in the spanish wife whom manzarin thrust into his reluctant arms when he was little more than a boy and when his heart was in marie mancini's keeping among all the fair and frail women who succeeded one another in his attention three stand out from the rest with a prominence which his special favour assigned to each in turn for ten early years it was louise de le bon le blanc better known to fame as the duchesse de la valliere 
who reigned as his uncrowned queen, and who gave her life to his pleasure and to the care of the children she bore to him. But such constancy could not last for ever in a man so constitutionally inconstant as Louis. When the Marquise de Montespan, in all her radiant and sensuous loveliness, came on the scene, she drew the king to her arms as a flame lures the moth. Her voluptuous charms, her abounding vitality and witty tongue, made the more refined beauty and the gentleness of the Duchesse flavourless in comparison, and Louise, realising that her sun had set, retired to spend the rest of her life in the prayers and piety of a convent, leaving her brilliant rival in undisputed possession of the field. For many years Madame de Montespan, the most consummate courtesan who ever enslaved a king, queened it over Louis in her magnificent apartments at Versailles and in the Tuileries. He was never weary of showering rich gifts and favours on her, and in return she became the mother of his children and ministered to his every whim, little dreaming of the day when she in turn was to be dethroned by an insignificant widow whom she regarded as the creature of her bounty, and who so often awaited her pleasure in her ante-room. When Françoise d'Aubigné was cradled one November day in the year 1635, within the walls of a fortress prison in Poitou, the prospect of a queendom seemed as remote as a palace in the moon. She had good blood in her veins, it is true. Her ancestors had been noblemen of Normandy before the conqueror ever thought of crossing the English Channel, and her grandfather, General Théodore d'Aubigné, had won distinction as a soldier on many a battlefield. It was to her father, profligate and spendthrift, who, after squandering his patrimony, had found himself lodged in jail, that Françoise owed the ignominy of her birthplace, for her mother had insisted on sharing the captivity of her ne'er-do-well husband. When at last Constant d'Aubigné found his prison doors opened, he shook the dust of France off his feet and took his wife and young children away to Martinique, where, at least he hoped, his record would not be known. On the voyage, we are told, the child was brought so near to death's door by an illness that her body was actually on the point of being flung overboard, when her mother detected signs of life and rescued her from a watery grave. A little later in Martinique she had an equal narrow escape from death as the result of a snake-bite. A child thus twice miraculously preserved was evidently destined for better things than an early tomb, more than one declared, and so indeed it proved. When the father ended his misspent days in the West Indian island, the widow took her poverty and her fledglings back to France, where Françoise was placed under the charge of a Madame de Villette, to pick up such education as she could, in exchange for such menial work as looking after Madame's poultry and scrubbing her floors. When her mother in turn died, the child, she was only fifteen at the time, was taken to Paris by an aunt, whose miserliness or poverty often sent her hungry to bed. Such was Françoise's condition when she was taken one day to the house of Paul Scarron, the crippled poet, whose satires and burlesques kept Paris in a ripple of merriment, and to whom the child's poverty and friendless position made as powerful an appeal as her budding beauty and her modesty. It was a very tender heart that beat in the pain-racked, paralyzed body of the father of French burlesque, and within a few days of first setting eyes on his little Indian girl, as he called her, he asked her to marry him. "'It is a sorry offer to make you, my dear child,' he said, "'but it is either this or a convent.' And to escape the convent, Françoise consented to become the wife of the bundle of pains and deformities, old enough to be her father. In the marriage contract, Scarron, with characteristic buffoonery, recognizes her as bringing a dower of four louis, two large and very expressive eyes, a fine bosom, a pair of lovely hands, and a good intellect. While to the attorney, when asked what his contribution was, he answered, I give her my name, and that means immortality. 
For eight years Francoise was the dutiful wife of her crippled husband, nursing him tenderly, managing his home and his purse, redeeming his writing from its coarseness, and generally proving her gratitude by a ceaseless devotion. Then came the day when Scarron bade her farewell on his deathbed, begging her with his last breath to remember him sometimes, and bidding her to be always virtuous. Thus Françoise d'Aubigné was thrown once more on a cold world, with nothing between her and starvation but Scarron's small pension, which the queen-mother continued to his widow, and compelled to seek a cheap refuge within convent walls. She had, however, good looks which might stand her in good stead. She was tall, with an imposing figure, and a natural dignity of carriage. She had a wealth of light brown hair, eyes dark and brilliant, full of fire and intelligence, a well-shaped nose, and an exquisitely modelled mouth. Beautiful she was beyond doubt in these days of her prime, but there were thousands of more beautiful women in France, and for ten years Madame Scarron was left to languish within the convent walls, with never a lover to offer her release. When the queen-mother died, and with her the pitiful pension, her plight was indeed pitiful. Her petitions to the king fell on deaf ears, until Montespan, moved by her tears and entreaties, pleaded for her, and Louis at last gave a reluctant consent to continue the allowance. It was a happy inspiration that led Scarron's widow to the king's favourite, for Madame de Montespan's heart, ever better than her life, went out to the gentlewoman whom fate was treating so scurvily. Not content with procuring the pension, she placed her in charge of her nursery, an office of great trust and delicacy, and thus Madame Scarron found herself comfortably installed in the king's palace, with a salary of two thousand crowns a year. Her day of poverty and independence was at last ended. She had, in fact, though she little knew it, placed her foot on the ladder, at the summit of which was the dazzling prize of the king's hand. Those were happy years which followed. High in the favour of the king's mistress, loving the little ones given into her charge as if they were her own children, especially the eldest-born, the delicate and warm-hearted Duc de Maine, who was also his father's darling, Madame had nothing left to wish for in life. Her days were full of duty, of peace and contentment. Even Louis, as he watched the loving care she lavished on his children, began to thaw and to smile on her, and to find pleasure in his visits to the nursery, which grew more and more frequent. There was a charm in this sweet-eyed, gentle-voiced widow, whose tongue was so skilful in wise and pleasant words. Her patient devotion deserved recognition. He gave orders that more fitting apartments should be assigned to Madame, a suite little less sumptuous than that of Montespan herself, and that money should not be lacking, he made her a gift of two hundred thousand francs, which the provident widow promptly invested in the purchase of the castle and estate of Maintenon. Such marked favours as these not unnaturally set jealous tongues wagging. Even Montespan began to grow uneasy, and to wonder what was coming next. When she ventured to refer sarcastically to the use Scarron's widow had made of his present, Louis silenced her by answering, "'In my opinion, Madame de Maintenon has acted very wisely.' Thus, by a word, conferring noble rank on the woman, his favourite was already beginning to fear as a rival. And indeed there were soon to be sufficient grounds for Montespan's jealousy and alarm. Every day saw Louis more and more under the spell of his children's governess, the middle-aged woman whose musical voice, gentle eyes, and wise words of counsel were opening a new and better world to him. She knew, as well as himself, how sated and weary he was of the cup of pleasure he had now drained to its last dregs of disillusionment, and he listened with eager ears to the words which pointed to him a surer path of happiness. Even reproof from her lips became more grateful to him than the sweetest flatteries from those of the most beautiful women who counted but half of her years. The growing influence of the widow Scarron over the Sun King had already become the chief gossip of the court. From the allurements of Montespan, of Mademoiselle de Fontaine, and of de Ludre, 
he loved to escape to the apartments of the soft-voiced woman who cared so much more for his soul than for his smiles his majesty's interviews with madame de maintenon madame de sevigné writes become more and more frequent and they last from six in the morning to ten at night she sitting in one armchair he in another in vain montespan stormed and wept in her fits of jealous rage in vain did the beautiful desfontanges seek to lure him to her arms until death claimed her so tragically before she had well passed her twentieth birthday the king had had more than enough of such delilahs pleasure had palled peace was what he craved now salve for his seared conscience when madame de maintenon was appointed principal lady-in-waiting to the dauphin and when a little later louis unhappy queen drew her last breath in her arms montespan at last realized that her day of power was over she wrote letters to the king begging him not to withdraw his affection from her but to these appeals louis was silent he handed the letters to madame de maintenon to answer as she willed the court was quick to realize that a new star had risen ministers and ambassadors now flocked to the new divinity to consult her and to win her favor the governess was hailed as the new queen of louis and of france the climax came when the king was thrown one day from his horse while hunting and broke his arm it was madame de maintenon alone who was allowed to nurse him and who was by his side night and day before the arm was well again she was standing thickly veiled before an improvised altar in the king's study with louis by her side while the words that made them man and wife were pronounced by archbishop de arlay the prison child had now reached the loftiest pinnacle in the land of her birth though she wore no crown she was queen of france wielding a power which few throned ladies have ever known princes and princesses rose to greet her entry with bows and curtsies the mother of the coming king called her aunt her rooms splendid as the king's adjoined his she had the place of honour in the king's council room the state's secrets were in her keeping she guided and controlled the destinies of the nation and all this greatness came to her when she had passed her fiftieth year and when all the grace and bloom of youth were but a distant memory the king himself two years her junior and still in the prime of his manhood was her shadow paying to the plain middle-aged woman such deference and courtesy as he had never shown to the youth and beauty of her predecessors in his affection and she thus translated to dizzy heights kept a head as cool and a demeanour as modest as when she was scarron's widow the convent protege for power and splendour she cared no whit her ambition now as always was to be loved for herself to play a beautiful part in the world and to deserve the respect of all good men her chief pleasure was found away from the pomp and glitter of the court among her children of the saint cyr convent which she had founded for the education of the daughters of poor noblemen over whom she watched with loving and unflagging care and yet she was not happy not nearly as happy as in the days of her obscure widowhood i am dying of sorrow in the midst of luxury she wrote and again i cannot bear it i wish i were dead why she was so unhappy with her queendom and her environment of love and esteem and her life of good works it is impossible to say the fact remains inscrutable but still fact twenty-five years of such life of splendid sadness and louis his last days clouded by loss and suffering died with her prayers in his ears his coverlet moistened by her tears two years later years spent in prayers and masses and charitable work the queen dowager drew the last breath of her long life at saint cyr shortly after hearing that her beloved duke de maine her pet nursling of other days had been arrested and flung into prison End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simon Arusso. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 23. A Throned Barbarian. The dawn of the 18th century saw the thrones of France and Russia occupied by two of the most remarkable sovereigns who ever wore a crown. Louis the Fourteenth, the Sun King, whose splendors dazzled Europe and whose power held it in awe, and Peter the First of Russia, whose destructive sword swept Europe from Sweden to the Dardanelles, and whose clever brain laid sure the foundation of his country's greatness. Each of these royal rivals dwarfed all other fellow monarchs as the sun pales the stars and yet it would scarcely have been possible to find two men more widely different in all save their passion for power and their love of women which alone they had in common of the two peter is unquestionably to day the more arresting dominating figure although nearly two centuries have gone since he made his exit from the world we can still picture him in his pride towering a head higher than the tallest of his courtiers swart of face as if he had been born in africa with his black close curling hair his bold imperious eyes his powerful well-knit frame the muscles and stature of a goliath a kingly figure with majesty in every movement we see him too wilfully discarding the kingliness with which nature had so liberally dowered him now receiving ambassadors in a short dressing gown below which his bare legs were exposed a thick nightcap lined with linen on his head his stockings dropped down over his slippers now walking through the copenhagen streets grotesque in a green cap a brown overcoat with horn buttons worsted stockings full of darns and dirty cobbled shoes and again carousing red of face and loud of voice with his meanest subjects in some low tavern as the mood seizes him he plays the role of fireman for hours together goes carol singing in his ledge and reaps his harvest of coppers from the houses of his subjects rides a hobby horse at a village fair and shrieks with laughter until he falls off or plies so and plain in a shipbuilding yard sharing the meals and drinking bouts of his fellow workmen the french ambassador count Predon, wrote of him in seventeen twenty five it is utterly impossible at the present moment to approach the tsar on serious subjects he is altogether given up to his amusements which consist in going every day to the principal houses in the town with a suit of two hundred persons musicians and so forth who sing songs on every sort of subject and amuse themselves by eating and drinking at the expense of the persons they visit he never passed a single day without being the worse for drink baron polnitz tells us and his drinking companions were usually chosen from the most degraded of his subjects of both sexes with whom he consorted on the most familiar terms when his muddled brain occasionally awoke to the knowledge that he was a king he would bully and hector his boon comrades like any drunken trooper on one occasion when a young jewess refused to drain a goblet of neat brandy which he thrust into her hand he promptly administered two resounding boxes on her ears shouting vile hebrew spawn i'll teach thee to obey there was in him too a vein of savage cruelty which took remarkable forms a favourite pastime was to visit the torture chamber and gloat over the sufferings of the victims of the knout and the strapado or to attend and frequently to officiate at public executions once we are told at a banquet he amused himself by decapitating twenty streltsi emptying as many glasses of brandy between successive strokes and challenging the prussian envoy to repeat the feat mad there can be little doubt that peter had madness in his veins he was a degenerate and an epileptic subject to brainstorms which terrified all who witnessed them a sort of convulsion seized him which often for hours threw him into a most distressing condition his body was violently contorted his face distorted into horrible grimaces and he was further subject to paroxysms of rage during which it was almost certain death to approach him 
even in his saner moods as Valishevsky tells us, he joined to the roughness of a Russian baron all the coarseness of a Dutch sailor. Such, in brief suggestion, was Peter I of Russia, half savage, half sovereign, the strangest jumble of contradictions who has ever worn the imperial purple, a huge mastodon whose moral perceptions were all colossal and monstrous. It was perhaps inevitable that a man so primitive, so little removed from the animal, should find his chief pleasures in law pursuits and companionships. During his historic visit to London, after a hard day's work with ads and soul in the shipbuilding yard, the Tsar would adjourn with his fellow workmen to a public house in Great Tower Street, and smoke and drink ale and brandy, almost enough to float the vessel he had been helping to construct and in his own kingdom the favourite companion of his debauches were common soldiers and servants he chose his friends among the common herd looked after his household like any shopkeeper thrashed his wife like a peasant and sought his pleasure where the lower populace generally finds it his female companions were chosen rather for their coarseness than their charms and pleased him most when they were drunk it was thus fitting that he should make an empress of a scholarly maid who as we have seen in an earlier chapter had no vestige of beauty to commend her to his favour and whose chief attractions in his eyes were that she had a coarse tongue and was a first-rate topper it was thus a strange and unhappy caprice of fate that united peter while still a youth to his first empress the refined and sensitive eudoxia a woman as remote from her husband as the stars never was there a more incongruous bride than this delicately nurtured girl provided by the empress natalie for her coarse-grained son from the hour at which they stood together at the altar the union was doomed to tragic failure before the honeymoon waned Peter had terrified his bride by his brutality, and disgusted her by the open attentions he paid to his favourites of the hour, the daughters of Botticher, the goldsmith, and Mons, the wine merchant. For five years husband and wife saw little of each other, and when in 1694 Natalie's death removed the one influence which gave the union at least the outward form of substance, Peter lost no time in exhibiting his true colours. He dismissed all Eudoxia's relatives from the court, and sent her father into exile. One brother he caused to be whipped in public, Another was put to the torture which had horrible climax when Peter himself saturated his victim's clothes with spirits of wine and then set them on fire. For Eudoxia a different fate was reserved. Not only had he long grown weary of her insipid beauty and of her refinement and gentleness, which were a constant mute reproach to his own low tastes and hectoring manners, he had grown to hate the very sight of her, and determined that she should no longer stand between him and the unbridled indulgence of his pleasures during his visit to england he never once wrote to her and on his return to moscow his first words were a brutal announcement of his intention to be rid of her in vain she pleaded and wept to her tearful inquiries what have i done to offend you what fault have you to find with me he turned a deaf ear i never want to see you again were his last inexorable words a few days later a hackney coach drove up to the palace doors the unhappy tsarina was bundled unceremoniously into it and she was carried away to the nunnery of the intercession of the blessed virgin whose doors were closed on her for a score of years pitiful years they were for the young empress consigned by her husband to a life that was worse than death robbed of her rank her splendours and luxuries her very name she was now only helen the nun faring worse than the meanest of her sister nuns for while they at least had plenty to eat the tsarina seems many a time to have known the pangs of hunger the letters she wrote to one of her brothers are pathetic evidence of the straits to which she was reduced for pity's sake she wrote give me food and drink give clothes to the beggar there is nothing here i do not need a great deal still i must eat it is not to be wondered at 
that in her misery she should turn anywhere for succour and sympathy and both came to her at last in the guise of major glebov an officer in the district whose heart was touched by the sadness of her fate he sent her food and wine to restore her strength and warm furs to protect her from the iciness of her cell in response to her letters of thanks he visited her again and again bringing sunshine into her darkened life with his presence and soothing her with words of sympathy and encouragement until gratitude to the good samaritan grew into love for the man when she learned that the man who had so befriended her was himself poor actually in money difficulties she insisted on giving him every rouble she could wring by any abject appeal out of her friends and relatives she became his very slave grovelling at his feet where thy heart is dearest one she wrote to him there is mine also where thy tongue is there is my head thy will is also mine she loved him with a passion which broke down all barriers of modesty and prudence reckless of the fact that he had a wife and she had a husband when major glebov's visits and letters grew more and more infrequent she suffered tortures of anxiety and despair my light my soul my joy she wrote in one distracted letter has the cruel hour of separation come already oh my light how can i live apart from thee how can i endure existence rather would i see my soul parted from my body god alone knows how dear thou art to me why do i love thee so much my adored one that without thee life is so worthless why art thou angry with me why my batyushka dost thou not come to see me have pity on me o oh my lord and come to see me to-morrow o oh my world my dearest and best answer me do not let me die of grief thus one distracted incoherent letter followed another heart-breaking in their grief pitiful in their appeal come to me she cried without thee i shall die why dost thou cause me such anguish have i been guilty without knowing it better far to have struck me to have punished me in any way for this fault i have innocently committed and again why am i not dead oh that thou hadst buried me with thy own hands forgive me o oh my soul do not let me die send me but a crust of bread thou hast beaten with thy teeth or the waistcoat thou hast often worn that i may have something to bring thee near to me what answers if any the major's vouchsafed to these pathetic letters we know not the probability is that they received no answer that the good samaritan had either wearied off or grown alarmed at the passion which he could not return and which was fraught with danger it was accident only that revealed to the world the story of this strange and tragic infatuation when the tsarevich alexis was brought to trial in seventeen eighteen on a charge of conspiracy against his father peter suspecting that eudoxia had had a hand in the rebellion ordered a descent on the nunnery and an inquiry nothing was found to connect her with her son's ill-fated venture but the inquiry revealed the whole story of her relations with a too friendly officer the evidence of the nuns and servants alone evidence of frequent and long meetings by day and night of embraces exchanged was sufficiently conclusive without the incriminating letters which were discovered in the major's bureau labelled letters from the tsarina or eudoxia's confession which was extorted from her this was an opportunity of vengeance such as exceeded all the tsar's hopes glebov was arrested and put on his trial evidence was forced from the nuns by the lashing of the knout so severe that some of them died under it glebov subjected to such frightful tortures that in his agony he confessed much more than the truth was sentenced to death by impalement in order to prolong his suffering to the last possible moment he was warmly wrapped in furs to protect him from the bitter cold and for twenty-eight hours he suffered indescribable agony until at last death came to his release as for eudoxia her punishment was a public flogging and consignment to a nunnery still more isolated and miserable than that in which she had dragged out twenty years of her broken life here she remained for seven years until on the tsar's death 
an even worse fate befell her she was then by catherine's orders taken from the convent and flung into the most loathsome rat-infested dungeon of the fortress of schlussenberg where she remained for two years of unspeakable horror then at last after nearly thirty years of life that was worse than death the sun shone again for her one day her dungeon door flew open and to the bowing of obsequious courtiers the prisoner was conducted to a sumptuous apartment the walls were hung with splendid stuffs the table was covered with gold plate ten thousand roubles awaited her in a casket courtiers stood in her antechamber carriages and horses were at her orders catherine the scholarly empress was dead eudoxia's grandson peter the second now wore the crown of russia and eudoxia found herself transported as by the touch of a magic wand from her loathsome prison cell to the old-time splendors of palaces the greatest lady in old russia to whom princesses ambassadors and courtiers were all proud to pay respectful homage but the transformation had come too late her life was crushed beyond restoration and after a few months of her new glory she was glad to find an asylum once more within convent walls until death the great healer of broken hearts took her to where beyond these voices there is peace while eudoxia was eating her heart out in her convent cell her husband was finding ample compensation for her absence in bacchanalian orgies and the company of his galaxies of favourites from tradesmen daughters to servant maids of buxom charms such as the livonian peasant girl in whom he found his second empress of the almost countless women who thus fell under his baneful influence one stands out from the rest by reason of the tragedy which surrounds her memory mary hamilton was no low-born maid such as peter especially chose to honour with his attentions she had in her veins the blood of the ducal hamiltons of scotland and of many a noble family of russia from which her more immediate ancestors had taken their wives and it was an ill fate that took her when little more than a child to the most debased court of europe to play the part of a maid of honour and thus to cross the path of the most unprincipled lover in europe peter's infatuation for the pretty young scotswoman however was but short-lived she had none of the vulgar attractions that could win him to any kind of constancy and he quickly abandoned her for the more agreeable company of his dinge chicks leaving her to find consolation in the affection of more courtly if less exalted lovers notably the young count orloff who proved as faithless as his master such was mary's infatuation for the worthless count that under his influence she stooped to various kinds of crime from stealing the tsarina's jewels to fill her lover's purse to infanticide the climax came when an important document was missing from the tsar's cabinet suspicion pointed to orloff as a thief he was arrested and when brought into peter's presence not only confessed to the thefts and to his share in making away with the undesirable infants but betrayed the partner of his guilt there was short shrift for poor mary hamilton when she was put on her trial on these grave charges she made full confession of her crimes but no torture could wring from her the name of the man for love of whom she had committed them and of whose treachery to her she was ignorant she was sentenced to death and one march day in the year seventeen nineteen she was led to the scaffold in a white silk gown trimmed with black ribbons then followed one of the grimmest scenes recorded in history peter the man who had been the first to betray her and who had refused her pardon even when her cause was pleaded by his wife was a keenly interested spectator of her execution at the foot of the scaffold he embraced her and exhorted her to pray before stepping aside to give place to the headsman when the axe had done its deadly work he again stepped forward picked up the lifeless and still beautiful head which had rolled into the mud and calmly proceeded to give a lecture on anatomy to the assembled crowd drawing attention to the number and nature of the organs severed by the axe his lecture concluded 
he kissed the pale dead lips crossed himself and walked away with a smile of satisfaction on his face end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Russo. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 24. A Friend of Marie Antoinette. There is scarcely a spectacle in the whole drama of history more pathetic than that of Marie Antoinette, dancing her light-hearted way through life to the guillotine, seemingly unconscious of the eyes of jealousy and hate that watched her every step or, if she noticed at all, returning a gay smile for a frown. Wedded when but a child, full of the joy of youth, with laughter bubbling on her pretty lips and gaiety dancing in her eyes, to a dull-witted clown to whom her fresh young beauty made no appeal, surrounded by court ladies jealous of her charms, feared for her foreign sympathies, and hated by a sullen, starving populace for her extravagance and her pursuit of pleasure, the Austrian princess, with all her young loveliness and the sweetness of her nature, could please no one in the land of her exile. Her very amiability was an offence, her unaffected simplicity a subject of scorn, and her love of pleasure a crime. Had she realized the danger of her position and adapted herself to its demands, her story might have been written very differently but her tragedy was that she saw or heeded none of the danger signals that marked her path until it was too late to retrace a step, and that her most innocent pleasures were made to pave the way to her doom. Nothing, for instance, could have been more harmless to the seeming than Marie Antoinette's friendship for Yolande de Polignac, but this friendship had, beyond doubt, a greater part in her undoing than any other incident in her life. From the affair of the diamond necklace to her innocent infatuation for Count Fersen, and it would have been well for the Queen of France if Madame de Polignac had been content to remain in her rustic obscurity and had never crossed her path when yolande gabrielle de polastron was led to the altar one day in the year seventeen sixty seven by comte jules de polignac she never dreamt we may be sure of the dazzling role she was destined to play at the court of france like her husband she was a member of the smaller noblesse as proud as they were poor her husband it is true boasted a long pedigree with its roots in the dark ages but his family had given to france only one man of note the cardinal de polignac accomplished scholar courtier and man of affairs who was able to twist louis the fourteenth round his dexterous thumb and comte jules was the cardinal's great nephew and through his mother had mazarin blood in his veins but the young couple had a purse as short as their descent was long and the early years of their wedded life were spent in comte jules dilapidated chateau on an income less than the equivalent of a pound a day in a rustic retirement which was varied by an occasional jaunt to paris to see the sights and enjoy the little cheap gaiety comte jules however had a sister diane a clever-tongued ambitious young woman who had found a footing at court as lady-in-waiting to the comtesse d'artois and whom her brother and his wife were proud to visit on their rare journeys to the capital and it was during one of these visits that marie antoinette who had struck up an informal friendship with a sprightly laughter-loving diane first met the woman who was to play such an important and dangerous part in her life it was perhaps little wonder that the french queen craving for friendship and sympathy fell under the charm of yolande de polignac a girl still but a few years older than herself with a singular sweetness and wisdomness and beautiful as a dream the beauty of the young countess was indeed a revelation even in a court of fair women in the extravagant words of chroniclers of the time she had the most heavenly face that was ever seen her glance her smile every feature was angelic no picture could it was said do any justice to this lovely creature of the glorious brown hair and blue eyes who seemed so utterly unconscious of her beauty 
such was the woman who came into the life of marie antoinette and at once took possession of her heart at last the queen of france in her isolation had found the ideal friend she had sought so long in vain a woman young and beautiful like herself with kindred tastes eager as she was to enjoy life and with all the qualities to make a charming and sympathetic companion it was a case of love at first sight on marie antoinette's parts at least and each subsequent meeting only served to strengthen the link that bound these two women so strangely brought together the contest must come oftener to court the queen pleaded so that they might have more opportunities of meeting and of learning to know each other and when the contest pleaded poverty marie antoinette brushed the difficulty aside that could easily be arranged the queen had a vacancy in the ranks of her equerries monsieur le comte would accept the post and then madame would have her apartments at the court itself thus it was that comte jules wife was transported from her poor country chateau to the splendours of versailles installed as chère amie of the queen in place of the princess de lamballe and with a bow of fortune at her pretty feet and never did woman adapt herself more easily to such a change of environment it was indeed a great part of the charm of this remarkable woman that amid success which would have turned the head of almost any other of her sex she remained to her last day as simple and unaffected as when she won the queen's heart in diane de polignac's apartment so absolutely indifferent did she seem to her new splendours that when jealousy sought to undermine the queen's friendship she implored marie antoinette to allow her to go back to her old obscure life and it was only when the queen begged her to stay with arms around her neck and with streaming tears that she consented to remain by her side if the queen ever had any doubt that she had at last found a friend who loved her for herself the doubt was now finally dissipated such an unselfish love as this was a treasure to be prized and from this moment queen and waiting woman were inseparable when they were not strolling arm in arm in the corridors or gardens of versailles her majesty was spending her days in madame's apartments where as she said we are no longer queen and subject but just dear friends so unhappy was marie antoinette apart from her new friend that when madame de polignac gave birth to a child at passy the court itself was moved to la muette so that the queen could play the part of nurse by her friend's bedside such now was the queen's devotion that there was no favour she would not have gladly showered on the countess but to all such offers madame turned a deaf ear she wanted nothing but marie antoinette's love and friendship for herself but if the queen in her goodness chose to extend her favour to madame's relatives well that was another matter thus it was that comte jules soon blossomed into a duke and madame perforce became a duchesse with a coveted tabouret at court but they were still poor in spite of an equerry's pay and heavily in debt a matter which must be seen to the queen's purse satisfied every creditor to the tune of four hundred thousand livres and duke jules found himself lord of an estate which added seventy thousand livres yearly to his exchequer with another annual eighty thousand livres as revenue for his office of director general of posts of course if the queen would be so foolishly generous it was not the duchesse's fault and when marie antoinette next proposed to give a dowry of eight hundred thousand livres to the duchesse's daughter on her marriage to the comte de guiche and to raise the bridegroom to a dukedom well it was very sweet of her majesty and it was not for her to oppose such a lavish autocrat thus the shower of royal favours grew and it is perhaps little wonder that each new evidence of the queen's prodigality was greeted with curses by the mob clamouring for bread outside the palace gates while even her father's minister kaunitz in far vienna brutally dubbed the duchesse and her family a gang of thieves diane de polignac the duchesse's sister-in-law had long been made a countess and placed in charge of a royal household and the grateful shower fell on all who had any connection with the favourite her father-in-law cardinal de polignac's nephew was rescued from his rustic poverty to play the exalted role of ambassador an uncle was raised per saltum from curé to bishop the duchesse's widowed aunt was made happy by a pension of six thousand livres a year 
and her son-in-law, de Guiche, in addition to his dukedom, was rewarded further for his fortunate nuptials by valuable sinecure offices at court. So the tide of benefactions flowed until it was calculated that the Polignac family were drawing half a million livres every year as the fruits of the queen's partiality for her favorite. Little wonder that, at a time when France was groaning under dire poverty, the volume of curses should swell against the Austrian panther, who could thus squander gold while her subjects were starving, or that the court should be inflamed by jealousy at such favors shown to a family so obscure as the Polignacs. To the warnings of her own family, Marie Antoinette was deaf. What cared she for such exhibitions of spite and jealousy? She was queen, and if she wished to be generous to her favorite's family, none should say her nay, and thus, with a smile half careless, half defiant, she went to meet the doom which, though she little dreamt it, awaited her. The Duchesse was now promoted to the office of governess of the Queen's children, a position which was the prerogative of royalty itself, or at least of the very highest nobility. With her usual modesty, she had fought long against the promotion, but the Queen's will was law, and she had to submit to the inevitable as gracefully as she could. And now, we see her installed in the most splendid apartments at Versailles, holding a salon almost as regal as that of Marie Antoinette herself. She was surrounded by sicko fans and place seekers eager to capture the queen's favor through her, and such was her influence that a word from her was powerful enough to make or mar a minister. She held, in fact, the reins of power and was now more potent than the weak-kneed king himself. It was at this stage in her brilliant career that the Duchesse came under the spell of the Comte de Vaudreuil, handsome, courtly, an intriguer to his fingertips, a man of many accomplishments, of a supple tongue, and with great wealth to lend a glamour to his gifts, a man of rare fascination, and as dangerous as he was fascinating. The woman who had carried a level head through so much unaccustomed splendor and power became the veriest slave of this handsome, honey-tongued Comte, who ruled her as she in turn ruled the queen. At his bidding she made and unmade ministers, she obtained for him pensions and high offices, and robbed the treasury of nearly two million livres to fill his pockets. When Marie Antoinette at last ventured to thwart the Comte in his ambition to become the Dauphin's governor, he retaliated by poisoning the Duchesse's mind against her and bringing about the first estrangement between the friends. Torn between her infatuation for Vaudreuil and her love of the Queen, the Duchesse was in an awkward dilemma. It became necessary to choose between the two rivals, and that Vaudreuil's spell proved the stronger, her increasing coldness to Marie Antoinette soon proved. It was the rift within the lute which was to make the music of their friendship mute. The queen gradually withdrew herself from the Duchesse's salon, where she was sure to meet the insolent Vaudreuil, and thus the gulf gradually widened until the severance was complete. Evil days were now coming for Marie Antoinette. The affair of the diamond necklace had made powerful enemies. The Polignac family, taking the side of Vaudreuil and their protectress, were arrayed against her. France was rising on the tide of hate to sweep the Austrian and her husband from the throne. The horrors of the revolution were being loosed, and all who could were flying for safety to other lands. At this terrible crisis, the queen's thoughts were less for herself than for her friend of happier days. She sought the Duchesse and begged her to fly while there was still time. Then it was that, touched by such unselfish love, the Duchesse's pride broke down, and all her old love for her sovereign lady returned in full flood. Bursting into tears, she flung herself at Marie Antoinette's feet and begged forgiveness from the woman whose friendship she had spurned and whose life she had, however innocently, done so much to ruin. A few hours later, the Duchesse, disguised as a chambermaid and sitting by the coachman's side, was making her escape from France in company with her husband and other members of her family, while the Queen, who had loved her so well, was left to take the last tragic steps that had the guillotine for go. Just before the carriage started on its long and perilous journey, a note was thrust into the chambermaid's hand. Adieu, most tender of friends. How terrible is this word! But it is necessary. Adieu. 
I have only strength left to embrace you, your heart-broken Marie. Then ensued for the Duchesse a time of perilous journeying to safety. At Sans, her carriage was surrounded by a fierce mob, clamouring for the blood of the Aristos. Are the Polignac still with the Queen? demanded one man, thrusting his head into the carriage. The Polignacs, answered the Abbé de Balivier, with marvellous presence of mind. Oh, they have left Versailles long ago. Those vile persons have been got rid of. And with a howl of baffled rage, the mob allowed the carriage to continue its journey, taking with it the most hated of all the Polignacs, the chambermaid, whose heart, we may be sure, was in her mouth. Thus the Duchesse made her way through Switzerland to Turin and to Rome, and to Venice, where news came to her of the fall of the monarchy and Louis's execution. By the time she reached Vienna, on her restless wanderings, her health, shattered by hardships and by her anxiety for her friend, broke down completely. She was a dying woman, and when, a few months later, she learned that Marie Antoinette was also dead, a natural death, they mercifully told her, thank god she exclaimed now at last she is free from those bloodthirsty monsters now i can die in peace seven weeks later the duchesse drew her last breath with a name she still loved best in all the world on her lips in death she and her beloved queen were not divided End of chapter. Chapter 25 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 25 The Rival Sisters. It was an unkind fate that linked the lives of the 15th Louis of France and Marie Lezinska, Princess of Lorraine, and daughter of Stanislas, the dethroned King of Poland, for there was probably no princess in Europe less equipped by nature to hold the fickle allegiance of the young French king, and no royal husband less likely to bring happiness into the life of such a consort. When Princess Marie was called to the throne of France, she found herself transported from one of the most penurious and obscure to the most splendid of the courts of Europe, frightened and overwhelmed, as de Goncourt tells us, by the grandeur of the king, bringing to her husband nothing but obedience, to marriage only duty, trembling and faltering in her queenly role like some escaped nun lost in Versailles. Although by no means devoid of good looks, as Natia's portrait of her at this time proves, her attractions were shy ones, as her virtues were modest, almost ashamed. She shrank alike from the embraces of her husband and the gaieties of his court, finding her chief pleasure in music and painting, in long talks with the most serious-minded of her ladies, in masses and prayers, spending gloomy hours with her oratory with its death's head, which she always carried with her on her journeys such was the nun-like wife whom louis xv led to the altar shortly after he had entered his sixteenth year and had already had his initiation into that career of vice which he pursued with few intervals to the end of his life already at fifteen the king who has been mockingly dubbed le bien-aimé was breaking away from the austere hands of his boyhood's mentor cardinal fleury and was beginning to snatch a few fearful joys in the company of his minions such as the duc de la tremouille and the duc de gevre and a few gay women of whom the sprightly and beautiful princesse de la charolais was the ringleader but he was still nothing more than a big and gloomy child whose ill-balanced nature gravitated between fits of profound gloom and the wild abandonment of debauch one hour torn and shaken by religious terrors fears of hell and of death the next the very soul of hysterical gaiety with words of blasphemy on his lips the gayest member of a band of bacchanals in some midnight orgy to such a youth feverishly seeking distraction from his own black moods the demure devout princess 
ignorant of the caresses and coquetry of her sex, moving like a spectre among the brilliant, light-hearted ladies of his court, was the most unsuitable, the most impossible of brides. He quickly wearied of her company, and fled from her sighs and her homilies, to seek forgetfulness of her and of himself in the society of such sirens of the court as Mademoiselle de Beaujolais, Madame de Lauragais, and Mademoiselle de Charolais, whose coquetries and high spirits never failed to charm away his gloomy humours. But although one lady after another, from the most bewitching of madcaps, Mademoiselle de Charolais, to the dark-eyed buxom comtesse de toulouse practised on him all their allurements strove to awake his senses by a thousand coquetries a thousand assaults the king's timidity eluded these advances which amused and alarmed but did not tempt his heart that young monarch's heart was still so full of the aged fleury's terrifying tales of the woman of the regency such coyness however was not long to stand in the way of the king's appetite for pleasure which every day strengthened one day it began to be whispered that at last louis had been vanquished that at a supper at le muette he had proposed the health of an unknown fair which had been drunk with acclamation by his boon companions and the court was full of excited speculation as to who his mysterious charmer would be that some new and powerful influence had come into the young sovereign's life was abundantly clear from the new light that shone in his eyes the laughter that was now always on his lips he had said good-bye to melancholy he astonished all by his new vivacity and became the leader in one dissipation after another whose noisy merriment he led and prolonged far into the night it was not long before the identity of the worker of this miracle was revealed to the world she had been recognized more than once when making her stealthy way to the king's apartments she was his chosen companion on his journey to compagne and it was soon public knowledge that madame de Maille was the woman who had captured the king's elusive heart and indeed there was little occasion for surprise for madame de Maille, although she would never see her thirtieth birthday again was one of the most seductive women in all of france black-eyed crimson-lipped oval-faced madame de Maille was one of those women who with cheeks on fire and blood astir eyes large and lustrous as the eyes of juno with bold carriage and in free toilettes step forward out of the past with the proud and insolent graces of the divinities of some bacchanalia with the provocative and sensual charm which is so powerful in its appeal she had a rare skill in displaying her beauty to its fullest advantage her cult of the toilette the duc de lune tells us went with her even by night she never went to bed without decking herself with all her diamonds and her most seductive hour was in the morning when in her bed with her glorious dishevelled hair veiling her pillow a glitter with her jewels she gave audience to her friends such was the ravishing ardent passionate woman who was the first of many to carry louis's heart by storm and to be established in his palace as his mistress to inaugurate for him a new life of pleasure and to estrange him still more from his unhappy queen shut up with her prayers and her tears in her own room with her tapestry her books of history and her music for soul relaxation the most innocent pleasures queen marie wrote sadly at this time are not for me under madame de Maille's rule the court of versailles awoke to a new life the little apartments grow animated gay to the point of license noise merriment and even gayer and livelier clash of glasses matter nights fete succeeded fete in brilliant sequence each night saw its royal debauch with the king and his mistress for arch spirits of the revels there were nightly banquets with the rarest wines and the most costly viands supplemented by salads prepared by the dainty hands of mademoiselle de charolais and ragouts cooked by louis himself in silver saucepans and these were followed by orgies which left the celebrants in the last excesses of intoxication to be gathered up at break of day and carried helpless to bed 
such wild excesses could not fail sooner or later to bring satiety to a lover so unstable as louis and it was not long before he grew a little weary of his mistress who too assured of her conquest began to exhibit sudden whims and caprices and fits of obstinacy her jealous eyes followed him everywhere her reproaches if he so much as smiled on a rival beauty provoked daily quarrels he was drawn much against his will into her family disputes and into the disgraceful affairs of her father the dissolute marquis de nesle meanwhile madame de maille's supremacy was being threatened in a most unexpected quarter among the pupils of the convent school at port royal was a young girl in whose ambitious brain the project was forming of supplanting the king's favourite and of ruling france and louis at the same time the idle dream of a schoolgirl of course but to felicite de nesle it was no vain dream but the ambition of a lifetime which dominated her more and more as the months passed in her convent seclusion if her sister madame de maille had so easily made a conquest of the king why should she with less beauty it is true but with a much cleverer brain despair and thus it was that every letter madame received from her little sister pleaded for an invitation to court until at last mademoiselle de nesle found herself the guest of louis's mistress in his palace thus the first important step was taken the rest would be easy for mademoiselle never doubted for a moment her ability to carry out her program to its splendid climax it was certainly a bold almost impudent design for the girl of the convent had few attractions to appeal to a monarch so surrounded by beauty as the king of france what the courtiers saw says the duc de richelieu was a long neck clumsily set on the shoulders a masculine figure and carriage features not unlike those of madame de maille but thinner and harder which exhibited none of her flashes of kindness her tenderness of passion even her manners seemed calculated to repel rather than attract the man she meant to conquer for she treated him from the first with a familiarity amounting almost to rudeness and a wilfulness to which he was by no means accustomed there was at any rate something novel and piquant in an attitude so different from that of all other court ladies resentment was soon replaced by interest and interest by attraction until louis before he was aware of it began to find the society of the impish mocking defiant maid from the convent more to his taste than that of the most fascinating women of his court the more he saw of her the more effectually he became under her spell each day found her in some new and tantalizing mood and as she drew him more and more into her toils she kept him there by her ingenuity in devising novel pleasures and entertainments for him until within a month of setting eyes on her he was telling madame de maille he loved her sister more than herself one of the first evidences of his favour was to provide her with a husband in the comte de vintimille and a dower of two hundred thousand livres he promised her a post as lady-in-waiting to madame de dauphine and gave her a sumptuous suite of rooms at versailles he even conferred on her husband the honour of handing him his shirt on the wedding night an evidence of high favour such as no other bridegroom had enjoyed it was thus little surprise to any one to find the comtesse bride not only her sister's most formidable rival but actually usurping her place and privileges nor was it long before this place on which she had set her heart first within the walls of the port royal convent was unassailably hers and madame de maille in tears and sadness saw an unbridgeable gulf widen between her and the man she undoubtedly had grown to love that felicite de nesle had not overestimated her powers of conquest was soon apparent louis became her abject slave humouring her caprices and submitting to her will and this will let it be said to her credit she exercised largely for his good she weaned him from his vicious ways she stimulated whatever good remained in him 
she tried and in a measure succeeded in making a man of him under her influence he began to realize that he was a king and to play his exalted part more worthily he asserted himself in a variety of directions from looking personally after the ordering of his household to taking the reins of state into his own hands nor did she curtail his pleasures she merely gave them a saner direction orgies and midnight revelry became things of the past but their place was taken by delightful days spent at the chateau of choisy that regal little pleasure-house between the waters of the seine and the forest of senar with all its marvels of costly and artistic furnishing here one entertainment succeeded another from the hunting which opened to the card games which closed the day a time of innocent delights which came sweet to the jaded palate of the king thus the halcyon months passed until one august day in seventeen forty one the comtesse was seized with a slight fever louis consumed by anxiety spending the anxious hours by her bedside or pacing the corridor outside two days later he was stooping to kiss an infant presented to him on a cushion of cramoisie velvet his happiness was crowned at last and life spread before him a prospect of many such years but tragedy was already brooding over this scene of pleasure although none least of all the king seemed to see the shadow of her wings one early day in december madame de vintimille was seized with a severe illness as sudden as it was mysterious physicians were hastily summoned from paris only to louis's despair to declare that they could do nothing to save the life of the comtesse tortured by excruciating pain says the goncourt struggling against a death which was full of terror and which seemed to point to the violence of poison the dying woman sent for a confessor she died almost instantly in his arms before the sacraments could be administered and as the confessor charged with the dead woman's last penitent message to her sister entered madame de Maly's salon he dropped dead here indeed was tragedy in its most sudden and terrible form the king was stunned incredulous he refused to believe that the woman he had so lately clasped in his arms so warm so full of life was dead and when at last the truth broke on him with crushing force he was as a man distraught he shut himself up in his room and listened half dead to a mass from his bed he would not allow any but the priest to come near him he repulsed all efforts at consolation and whilst louis was thus alone with his demented grief thrust away in a stable of the palace lay the body of the dead woman which had been kept for a cast to be taken that distorted countenance that mouth which had breathed out its soul in a convulsion so that the efforts of two men were required to close it for moulding the already decomposing remains of madame de vintimille served as a plaything and a laughing-stock to the children and lackeys when the storm of his grief at last began to abate the king retired to his remote country seat of saint leger carrying his broken heart with him and also madame de Maly, as sharer of his sorrow for it was to the woman whom he had so lightly discarded that he first turned for solace at saint leger he passed his days in reading and re-reading the two thousand letters the dead comtesse had written to him sprinkling their perfumed pages with his tears and when he was not thus burying himself in the past he was a prey to the terrors that had obsessed his childhood the fear of death and of hell at supper the only meal which he shared with others he refused to touch meat in order that he might not commit sin on every side if a light word was spoken he would rebuke the speaker by talk of death and judgment and if his eyes met those of madame de Maly, he burst into tears and was led sobbing from the room the communion of grief gradually awoke in him his old affection for madame de Maly, and for a time it seemed not unlikely that she might regain her lost supremacy but the discarded mistress had many enemies at court 
who were by no means willing to see her re-established in favour the chief of them the duc de richelieu the handsomest man and the hero of more scandalous amours than any other in france a man moreover of crafty brain who had already acquired an ascendancy over the king's mind with madame de tencin a woman as scheming and with as evil a reputation as himself for chief ally the duke determined to find another mistress who should finally oust madame de mailly from louis's favour and her he found in a woman devoted to himself and his interests and of such surpassing loveliness that when the king first saw her at petit bourg he exclaimed heavens how beautiful she is such was the involuntary tribute louis paid at first sight to the charms of madame de la tournelle who was now fated to take the place of her dead sister madame de vintimille just as the comtesse had supplanted another sister madame de mailly chapter twenty five